This is a, a sombre and, for me, a surreal Crime Watch UK. For all of us here, it can be gruelling coping with crimes against victims who are strangers. It's been almost unbearable dealing with Jill's death. Jill Dando was much more than a colleague. She was everyone's friend. Crime Watch is poorer without her. But this programme was her passion. And now, as Jill helped others, we hope we can do the same for her, for her family, and for her fiancé, Alan. My senior police officer arrived at my work to tell me that a lady of Jill's description had been attacked on Jill's doorstep and had been rushed to Charing Cross Hospital and had subsequently died from her injuries. We've had to look at everything. We've had to look at it in the complete 360 degrees at all sorts of things that were happening. But we've been looking at facts and we've been looking at evidence. And one of the first pieces of information and real facts are when the postman was delivering mail to Jill Dando's house, number 29 Gowan Avenue. I was delivering mail along the odd numbers till I reached 29, which I know is Jill Dando's house. I've met Jill a few times, either delivering her mail or passing her in the street. I took a couple of paces down the front garden path and just before I reached the front garden gate I saw a man standing in the road looking directly at number 29. Uh, it was like he thought someone was going to receive the mail. I was looking for illegally parked cars on both sides of the road and I noticed a Range Rover facing the Fulham Palace Road. I started to type the registration number in and suddenly I noticed this man that was sitting in the driver's seat. And I was quite sort of startled and a bit embarrassed. So I just walked off towards Monster Road. And at the, back, the same time, a driver saw another man and he was near the other end of Gowan Avenue. I was coming out of Bishop's Road and wanted to turn right in the immediate left to cross Munster Road into Gowan Avenue and he was outside the glazier's shop and as I went he crossed he kept looking up and down the road I thought maybe he was looking for the road name he was looking up if you were in Gowan Avenue on that day now is the time to come forward and tell us getting towards the end of Gowan Avenue on the Fulham Palace Road end I was conscious that somebody was sitting on my tail as it were you know it was hurrying me. I had got the impression there was more than one person, there was a couple of people in the car. I was feeling very pressured by the car behind, I could hear it revving. And if that was you, and you were in a hurry in your Range Rover, we do want to hear from you to eliminate you from the inquiry. I went straight up Dunraley Road, dead opposite Gowan, and turned right at the end to come out by Fulham Football Club and I felt sort of pressured into going faster than I wanted to. I sort of looked over my shoulder and saw the Range Rover parking sort of opposite Fulham Football Club. It is important to eliminate this vehicle. There were several sightings of a blue Range Rover, dark blue Range Rover. Were you parked up in the Fulham Football Club or driving around that area on the 26th of April? We would like to know, we need to know if you were there. Next is a window cleaner and he was opposite Jill's house. And he saw a man again walking, wandering around outside number 29. The window cleaner thought he was an estate agent. He was carrying a mobile phone and was talking into the mobile phone. He described him as having blonde hair, but smart in appearance, wearing a suit. Almost all the witnesses talk of a man in a suit with dark hair or black hair. So this man, the window cleaner, sees someone with blonde hair. Now he may be someone completely innocent, or is he the person that we're looking for? Another sighting of yet another dark blue Range Rover is around about 11 o'clock. A man is driving again in Gowan Avenue, but going the other way. He had noticed a man 
in Gowan Avenue, standing between two parked cars, just standing there. As he approaches Gowan Avenue, Munster Road, and he turns left, parked right on the corner there, but also on the curb, is a dark blue Range Rover. There's nobody in it. I'd better go. I don't want to get a ticket. Yeah, I'd right. love to glue in. Bye. I was weighing up whether to go home or to Sally Parsons, a shop on Fulham Road. I was thinking quite hard about it, and as I sat there, there was a man about one car length away. He had noticeable dark hair and a blue suit, and he didn't seem uncomfortable or uneasy. Um, I was thinking of my dilemma at the time, but I was somehow dimly aware that he might have been an estate agent. I saw a man standing on the corner of Gowan Avenue, just very, very agitated. And the one thing that I couldn't help but keep looking at was like the glasses he had on his face. They didn't seem to fit. I think it is always difficult for anybody to cope if they don't know why something has happened. This is a situation which defies all logic, is totally impossible to explain and therefore totally impossible to understand at this moment in time. Even an explanation will not change the situation and will probably not change the fact that I don't understand what has happened or why it has happened. I heard a scream. I looked out the window and saw uh, a character walk away and also saw a chap coming out of number 30. I came out of the front door and I saw this man running down the street and he immediately alerted my attention because he was furtive. He was up to no good. I could tell it at once. What we found is four witnesses who see a man or different men running down the Fulham Palace Road towards Putney. And the first witness is somebody who had been to the betting shop. About 11.37, 11.38, he saw a man running across the Fulham Palace Road from the Gowan Avenue side and a car nearly knocked him down. And the man saw him run to the west side of Fulham Palace Road and start to run down Fulham Palace Road. Another lady saw a man running down the Bishop's Park side of Fulham Palace Road carrying a mobile phone and talking into the mobile phone and she found that very odd. Is that the same man who had just run over the pedestrian crossing? Further down the Fulham Palace Road, a few minutes later, a lady is driving a truck north and sees a man, as she describes, running for all his life, wearing a suit, dark hair, south towards Putney. He was carrying a mobile phone. At roughly the same time, a van driver is going towards Putney in the Fulham Palace Road and a man ran out in front of him and the van driver had to brake heavily to avoid hitting him. Stupid idiot! That witness saw the man run across the Fulham Palace Road and into Bishop's Park. So there are four witnesses seeing a man running almost the full length of Fulham Palace Road, crossing the road and going into the park. What we do know of the man in Gowan Avenue is that he was wearing a dark, waxy, barber-type jacket, thigh length. Certainly the man running in Fulham Palace Road was not wearing a jacket or coat. So we can't be sure that the man in Fulham Palace Road is the one in Gowan Avenue, but perhaps he was a lookout. Perhaps he was a man standing at the end of Gowan Avenue and then following the shooting, he has run away down the Fulham Palace Road separately. At around the time that he saw him run into Bishop's Park, there are a number of witnesses who saw a man in the park, by the railings by the river, acting suspiciously and oddly. Is he the same man as who ran across the Fulham Palace Road? We're not sure. But certainly there was a woman in the park, and she saw a man leaning over the railings, talking on a mobile phone. And he was talking in a suspicious manner, and when she came by, he quietened his voice and was concerned of her presence. That man in particular 
had dark hair, but he was described as wearing a grey or dark coat, which was long thigh coat. That could be the same man who was seen running from Gowan Avenue, because the coat in particular is very similar. One of the witnesses saw a man climbing over the railings and onto the steps which lead down to the river. Who is that man? The witness does describe that man as wearing a royal blue windsheeter coat. Now that's certainly not the description of the man who was seen running from Gowan Avenue, which was a dark, waxy, barber-type coat. So there is a possibility, a strong possibility, that man has nothing to do with this inquiry. And if that is the case, if he came forward, we could eliminate him very quickly. And finally, there is a crucial witness at the bus stop in the Fulham Palace Road, opposite Bishop's Park. He just caught my attention, I don't know why. And then as he got closer, I could see he was sweating on his face as if he'd been running. You get these impressions, you know what I mean? I mean, I wouldn't even throw my orange peel on the floor because he gave me that impression that he was a policeman. And I thought, if I throw it on the floor, he's going to tell me, right, pick that up, you know. All his collar was all wet, like he'd been sweating. He was about five foot nine, five foot ten. He had a slightly foreign looking nose. He had a mark on his nose bridge as if he wore glasses. I was left at the bus stop with this man, the woman with the two children, and somebody, I think it was another girl who was just walking up towards the bus stop when he actually got there 220. And he never got into 74. 220 came. I let the young lady with the two children get on it because she was like at the end of her tether because the kids were being really bad. As I let them on, I looked at him. There was no response from him. I got on the bus and we left him at the 220 bus stop. The bus driver's records show that four people got onto that bus at the time the man who answers the EFIC was on. One of them was an elderly lady, one of them was a young man, 18, 19 years old. The bus driver can't remember the third person. So there are definitely three other people who can come forward with information concerning this man. We'd be interested to know what he was talking about. Did anybody hear part of that conversation? Was anybody annoyed by the phone ringing and someone suddenly start talking on the bus? Were you on that 74? We would like to hear from you. All four passengers got off. Where did he go from there? At this stage, we don't know. We've examined CCTV footage from the Putney Bridge railway station. He can't be found on there at this time. Did he go in a taxi? Did he go in a car? Did a car come along and pick him up? Or did he walk away over Putney Bridge or down back into the Fulham Road? Did anybody see him? We would like to know. Everybody associated with Jill in any way whatsoever finds it totally unbelievable that the tables are turned like this and we are actually in this absurd situation making a, an appeal on her behalf. The horrifying fact is that somebody has murdered the person that I had planned to spend the rest of my life with. Somebody has murdered a person who was so widely loved and respected by everybody she came across. It's impossible to comprehend that one is the victim of crime. Jill is the victim of crime and we are all the victims of that crime by virtue of the fact that we are horrendously affected by what has happened. Hamish Campbell, let's see how viewers can really help solve this. There are just so many sightings of so many people that they can't all be involved in Jill's murder. Why haven't they come forward to be eliminated? I think a lot of them believe that they've got nothing to contribute, that they were there innocently and therefore why should they come forward? But what I'm saying is it's essential they come forward because they help us determine the motive. Was there just one person involved in this killing or more than one? And as soon as everybody who was in that street comes forward, we can eliminate them and move the inquiry on. 
Hamish, supposing they have reasons for not wanting to come forward, they're concerned about their anonymity. I'm thinking particularly, for example, of Range Rover drivers. Yes. We know there must have been dozens of Range Rovers in that area at that time. Yes. We know the press has pointed out one of them was driving very badly. I mean, I, if I was that driver, would be reluctant to come forward. I'd fear a prosecution apart from anything else. I can understand that, but there's no concern in relation to track of traffic offences or minor matters. The concern here is the murder of Jill Dando. So if they've been involved in minor traffic matters, forget that. Ring us, tell us where you were on that day, which Range Rover you were driving, and where you were. That's a guarantee of immunity. Absolutely. And you want all Range Rovers in Fulham Monday, the 26th of April in that morning? Yes. Now, it's pretty clear from that reconstruction that the guy walking and running down Fulham Palace Road um, was one person I and mean, all the, the witness statements yes. seem to converge on that one description and yet that description is different from the gunman so the e-fit that you've issued the man at the bus stop in Fulham Palace Road may very well not be the killer that is possible and certainly the man in the Fulham Palace Road was not wearing a coat whereas the man in Gowan Avenue was so there's a strong indication that there are two different people the e-fit is of the man at the bus stop People need to focus on that for who is that man? Is he the lookout? Was he another party to the killing? But our key concern is the man in Gowan Avenue. But can we just stay with that man in the, uh, the bus stop first? Yes. It is possible he was running down Fulham. People run down roads every now and then for entirely as a reason about having shot someone. It is possible he is watching and recognises himself. Yes. If he comes forward, he's going to have a hell of a time. Isn't he? Not at all, but if he comes forward and he has nothing to do with that incident, then we can speak to him and eliminate him. He might have been late for an appointment, late for a bus, or, or whatever. As long as he comes forward and we can push the inquiry on. Again, can you guarantee him in a, anonymity? Yes. Now, you've always maintained this uh, the most difficult sort of inquiry for detectives, what do you call a 360 degree inquiry? Yes. Let's try and focus it so that, so that people can help. On the one hand, there's the possibility it's a conspiracy involving several people. Yes. And on the other, there's the prospect that it's just one person. Let's just take the criminal conspiracy idea first. Again, how can people help now, viewers of Crime Watch? It's important to remember that there's a, there's a large and substantial reward in this case. There's £100,000 from the Daily Mail. There's £50,000 from Crime Stoppers, where people can ring up anonymously and give us information. People need to ask themselves, as we have done, who has gained from this murder after 21 days? What do you mean, who's gained? Has someone gained financially? Has someone received money recently? Has somebody benefited in some way? Whether it's financial or emotional, there's a reason why Jill Dander was murdered, and people need to look now. Who has gained? What benefit has been achieved by this death? And come forward with any information. The reward money is there, it's substantial, and people need to think very, very hard tonight on what that is. Of course, one line to that reward and one line the criminal fraternity can help with is to trace the murder weapon. Yes. Now, of course, guns can be acquired abroad. We all know that. But assuming, we can't make that assumption, but let's for the moment make it, that th this gun was acquired in the United Kingdom. Yes. How would whoever mediated that sale recognize the weapon? Well, there the, are the two guns here this evening. And what we're saying is this gun here, the 9mm Browning, the larger firearm, is not the weapon that was involved in the killing of Giordano. Right, that's one that lots of newspapers and so forth have, have been portraying. It's yes. not that. Yes, it is this type of firearm. This is a 9mm short. Not only is the bullet shorter, but the whole weapon is smaller. It can be held in your palm of your hand, can be concealed in a pocket. People need to look now at this weapon. Have they recently handled this gun? Have they recently passed it on to somebody else? Have they disposed of it for somebody? Did they make arrangements before Monday the 26th of April to give this type of gun to somebody? There is the reward money. People need to look at this firearm and ring us tonight. Much less common than, than the bigger weapons. Considerably less common. When these weapons are sold illegally, they're usually sold with ammunition. What sort of ammunition was used to shoot? The ammunition that we used to shoot Jill Dando was 9mm short Remington manufacture. There was no suggestion that it was a dumb dumb bullet. There's no suggestion that this firearm was fitted with a silencer. So if somebody was involved in that sale, you're saying they can ring Crime Stoppers anonymously. Yes. Tell us the procedure about that. Supposing someone says, look, I want to get that £150,000 reward, but I'm not prepared to take the risk of prosecution for firearms offences. If they ring Crime Stoppers and they've got real information to give us concerning this firearm or anything else, they will be given a security number, and it's that security number which will identify them with Crime Stoppers, not the police, and the information can be passed to them, which in turn will be given to us. Now, we've been looking at the criminal conspiracy. Supposing it is just a loner. Yes. Then, then again, how can people watching this program help identify that man? 
if it is a loner, I mean, it could explain the apparent motivelessness of the crime, but maybe this person has a, a fixation or a strong fascination with Gildando. Maybe he's displayed that in some way with collection of photographs, constant talking. I'm not sure, but people need to look again to their partners or others. Was he concerned or fascinated by Gildando? What was he doing on Monday the 26th of April? Was he late for work? Did he not turn up for work? Was there some features of it? his behaviour which was different on that day. Well, it's a free call number here, 0500 600 600. Please call if you can identify any of those people that have to be eliminated. And please let us know if you have any suspicions about an individual who may have done this. There are many more detectives standing by the incident room at Kensington. The number there is 0181 246 0732. 0181 246 0732. And let me repeat as if it needed saying that total reward is £150,000. Please, though, could I ask you, don't ring on the numbers I've just given you for condolences for Jill. We really need these lines open for the clues for our appeals tonight. It is one year on, but this investigation will not stop. There have been many theories, conspiracy theories, contract killings, but what I want to do is to put all that to one side and look at one very strong possibility that Jill was killed by a person working on his own. And I would like to look at the events which took place on the 26th of April and on some of the previous Mondays beforehand. I would like to look at the gun and the ammunition. And my appeal tonight is to the person responsible for killing Jill. And there's a very strong probability that he's watching this program tonight. On the 26th of April last year, there are a number of sightings of a person hanging around in Gowan Avenue, in Fulham, outside the address where Jill Dando lived. That a man was seen on two previous Mondays before the 26th. I noticed a man standing outside the nursery school. I was going to a cafe in Munster Road for breakfast. I was in the cafe about 35 to 40 minutes and when I left and started walking south down Munster Road he was still standing outside the nursery school. As I walked through the gateway, I noticed the man was now standing on the south side of Waldo Avenue at the junction with Munster Road by the tea shop. I left the house to go down the bookies on the Fulham Palace Road. I realised that the man that I'd seen a week earlier was now standing at the junction of Waldo Avenue and Silbury Street. And when I came back 20 minutes later, he was still standing where I'd seen him. As I was walking down Silbury Street, I saw the same man again. He sort of got a bit agitated and tried to hide his face while looking straight down at the pavement. Then on the morning of the 26th of April, a mother was driving her son to school in Gowan Avenue and she saw a man wearing a Trilby type hat. Watch him, Mum. He was looking up like he was waiting for something. He had the worst ill-fitting suit on that you could imagine. Well, he is a funny one. I was in Bishop's Road waiting to cross Munster Road. Out of the corner of my eye there was a man outside the double glazing shop. He looked out of context in every way. His clothes didn't fit, his hat didn't fit and he acted very strangely. About an hour later in Gowan Avenue and Munster Road, two other witnesses saw a man whom they both describe as wearing glasses which were far too big for him. There are some differences in these descriptions, but there are lots of similarities. We have a dozen witnesses describing a man in his 30s or 40s, tall, wearing a dark suit and agitated. Three of them said his suit was too big. Another three saw him in a Trilby hat. Several mentioned the mobile phone. He is the main person that we wish to speak to in this investigation. Jill Dando was shot between 11.30 and 11.35 on the 26th of April last year. She was shot once behind her left ear and the gun was in hard contact with her head. This was a violent, aggressive and appalling act against someone who had done no harm to anyone ever. There were no witnesses to the shooting, but two neighbours heard her scream and she must have seen her attacker in those last few seconds. Immediately after the shooting, a neighbour saw a man leaving the gate area of Jill Dando's house. Again, he was in his 30s or 40s, tall, with dark hair and baggy trousers. 
and a second neighbour saw the same man go down Gowan Avenue towards Fulham Palace Road. Left behind at the crime scene was the cartridge case and the bullet. It's a 9mm short or 380 calibre cartridge case made by Remington in the USA uh, on or after July 1994. Well, the, the cartridge case has six small, almost like pin pricks, round the case. Uh, these are stab crimps, which we think we used to hold the bullet in place. Uh, as you can see, they were made by a sharp tool, possibly uh, the tip of a short nail or a, an automatic center punch. Well, what is crimping? It's primarily to hold the bullet in the cartridge case. In this situation, what has he done? Has he found another bullet to put onto the cartridge case? Has the original bullet become loose? Or has he taken the bullet out and added powder or removed powder? Whatever the circumstances, he has knowledge of firearms and he has knowledge of the cartridge case to be able to do that and crimp it. We can tell from examination of the bullet that it was fired in a barrel that wasn't conventionally rifled. Uh, and we think it's likely that the gun that was used was a gun that was uh, originally deactivated and then criminally reconverted uh, using uh, a smooth bolt barrel. Well, clearly he's had to get the gun from somewhere. Handguns have been banned since 1997. So did he own the gun before that date? Or did he get possession of it shortly before the 26th of April? Has someone else received that gun after the 26th of April? So how can our appeal help you recognise the man who killed Jill Dando? He's someone who clearly has an interest in guns and firearms, experience in using them or handling them. And that can come from being a gun club member or perhaps from his occupation or previous occupation. Very likely to have specialist magazines relating to guns or ammunition. How old is he? We can't be precise but very likely between 30s and 40s, and that's certainly what the witnesses say who saw the man in the street. Was the Chilby hat and the glasses a disguise, or is that what the person normally wears? He's very likely to be alone, perhaps a loner, someone who's emotionally isolated. He's very likely to have had an interest in Jill Dando. What does this remind you of? Or if not Jill, an unhealthy attraction, infatuation, or obsession with other women. And what's more, we know men like that who become infatuated with people like Jill Dando. And that in turn turns to hate and resentment. This was not a random act. This was planned. The person arranged to be there. He knew the address. He was in the street that morning with the handgun. He had been able to take himself out of his ordinary routine to be there that Monday morning. What about the previous occasions when a man was seen in Gowan Avenue? The two Mondays and the Wednesdays before she was shot. That all takes planning. The murder took place at 11.30. Could the person you think of now been there at 11.30 from where they travelled? How long would it take to travel to Fulham and back? The worst thing with seeing the film clip of Jill's last moments was the fact that she was just going about doing the ordinary things that Jill did. And the fact that you do want to almost be able to stop the camera and stop the action and say to her, you know, shout at her and say, Jill, don't go home. Amen. If only the tape could be rewound. But Hamish, you really have now narrowed down this appeal quite a lot. We have, and what we're trying to say tonight is link these things together. The loner, the obsession with Jill Dando, the obsession with firearms, the ability to be in that street at that time on that Monday and previous Mondays, and the description. All together, they make sense. Alone and separate, they don't. Now, what do you mean by a loner? We all know people who are you know, not very gregarious. Do you mean, you know, as, as that witness said, a bit of a funny one? Yes, there is something odd about him, but he might be alone, but isolated, either emotionally isolated, not married, having difficulty with previous relationships with girlfriends. There will be an obviousness about this 
this separate, separate away from society and groups of people. And when you say obsessional about Jill, I mean yes. millions of people are fans of Jill, but you mean something very, very particular. Yes, we're not talking about respected admiration, the ordinary fan. This is an unhealthy interest in Jill Dando. Yes. And more importantly, it's unlikely to have been kept a secret. There will have been some telltale signs. Anyone in yes. particular? The example is the man who pretended to be her brother and was trying to get arrange her utilities to him. We know a number of people who have been eliminated, who have displayed this obsession, wanted to meet her, wanted to see her. That's the individual, but link it with the loner. Now you've said that you've at least one suspect who's been through, who didn't appear to any of his friends to have an obsession with Jill, but had an astonishing one when you looked into it. I mean, could there be more people like that? Presumably there are. There, I'm, I'm sure there are. I know there are. And if, even if there isn't an obsession with Jill Dando, it's an obsession with other women, previous relationships, or an obsession with something else. And that's where we talk about the obsession with guns or other features. So people would know, even if they weren't sure they had an obsession with Jill, he would be odd. And yes. couldn't he have kept the obsession about guns, this interest in guns secret? I don't think so. I mean, gun, handguns were banned in 1997. This won't have just started this obsession with guns, this interest, this ability to alter or change them. So a previous gun club member, this interest with guns and perhaps specialist books and magazines. So people need to look back in time, link guns, link loner, link obsession to Jill or other odd behaviour with women. And do you think he's watching now? I do. I feel sure he's watching now. And what I also know is nothing has been resolved by this killing and it won't be resolved. But there's one opportunity, and he can ring us now here in Crime Watch, he can ring the inquiry team and speak to somebody. There is detail in this crime which we know, and only he will know, and he must ring us now, and I feel sure that will resolve it. If he's going to ring, he needs to give you a detail that's not public, you're saying? Yes. Well, there you are. Please think about relatives, though, friends, acquaintances, anyone who fits any part of that pattern. Put these bits together. Let's then firmly eliminate whoever you can think of. N not only might you solve this terrible crime, but there's still the biggest reward in British criminal history waiting to be claimed, a quarter of a million pounds. 0500 600 600, or call the incident room directly on 0181 246 0732.